So now let's come back to that press release we started with. Scientific evidence that the entire universe is a holographic projection around the Earth. Here's what it said specifically. German scientists have been trying to understand why their equipment that measures gravitational waves has been picking up a particular sound. One possible answer that they've come up with is that the entire universe is a holographic illusion. For many months, the GEO 600 team members had been scratching their heads over inexplicable noise that is plaguing their giant detector. Then, out of the blue, a researcher approached them with an explanation. In fact, he had even predicted the noise before he knew they were detecting it. According to Craig Hogan, a physicist at the Fermilab Particle Physics Lab in Batavia, Illinois, GEO 600 has stumbled upon the fundamental limit of space-time, the point where space-time stops behaving like the smooth continuum Einstein described and instead dissolves into grains just as a newspaper photograph dissolves into dots as you zoom in. It looks like GEO 600 is being buffeted by the microscopic quantum convulsions of space-time, says Hogan. If this doesn't blow your socks off, then Hogan, who has just been appointed director of Fermilab's Center for Particle Astrophysics, has an even bigger shock in store. If the GEO 600 result is what I suspect it is, then we are all living in a giant cosmic hologram. The idea that we live in a hologram probably sounds absurd, but it is a natural extension of our best understanding of black holes, and something with a pretty firm theoretical footing. It has also been surprisingly helpful for physicists wrestling with theories of how the universe works at its most fundamental level. Let me remind you of what Michael Talbot said. It is relatively easy to understand this idea of holism in something that is external to us, like an apple in a hologram. What makes this difficult is that we are not looking at the hologram. We are part of the hologram. Maybe you recognize this. The last example of a hologram comes from the TV series Star Trek, The Next Generation. If you're not a Trekkie, the Starship Enterprise traveled around the universe 24-7-365. So there was no time or place for the crew to take a break or a vacation. Instead, they had something on board called the holodeck where any hologram could be created for you to enjoy in your free time. In this episode, Commander Riker is testing out some new improvements to the holodeck and wants to play some jazz in New Orleans. It's the attachment to the outcome that we need to let go of. Perhaps that's what the Buddha was trying to say. Now, the biggest problem with the secret and all other New Age self-help concepts, such as the Law of Attraction, is that when it doesn't work, which is most of the time, the player thinks they must have done something wrong, that they are deficient, defective, or somehow at fault for not manifesting something, and that all they need to do is improve themselves, spiritually evolve, and then it will work. This is not correct. It's not your fault that it doesn't work. It's because the basic premises underlying the secret and the law of attraction are incorrect, so they can't possibly work all the time, not even most of the time for most people. Every player is doing everything at every moment exactly right exactly what its infinite eye wants it to be doing. It is only the players who think they are less than perfect because they want things to be different than they are for some reason and believe they should have the power to change things. But they don't have that power. 
Only the infinite eye has the power to create or manifest anything. It's true that most players think they make money, and they have created all kinds of stories about how they make that money. By working, by selling something, by getting loans or gifts, by inheritance, by many different methods. But the truth is, according to these models, the infinite eye is the one who creates the money for its player, but it can only send it to its player in ways that the player believes it can receive it. The infinite eye needs no story to explain its creation of money. Only the player with its limiting beliefs and limited thinking needs a story to receive it. If we as players could let go of all these beliefs we have about money, could stop needing some story about how the money can come to us, it would take away all the limitations we put on receiving money and make the infinite eye's job so much easier. So how do we do that? How do we let go of our limiting beliefs about money and about other things as well? There's no easy answer to that question, but there are some techniques out there that might help some of you. Robert Scheinfeld has his process as part of his Tools for Transformation. Jed McKenna has his Spiritual Autolysis that he describes in his books. Byron Katie has her work. Psych K has its workshops. But the one thing you have to keep in mind and be very aware of whenever you try one of these techniques is that we do not want to trade one set of beliefs for another. We want to let go of our beliefs altogether. And the problem is that many techniques focus on the beliefs themselves, and that will take you nowhere. Because underneath every belief you have is a judgment. And if you don't also address and let go of the judgment, you'll just create another belief on top of it to replace the one you currently have. As I said in Part 4, talking about the rules of the human game, fear and resistance are the foundations of the first part of the human game and judgments and their resulting beliefs are the glue that keeps the illusions together. A belief is simply the result of a judgment hiding in the corner of your mind, just like an opinion is the result of a belief you have adopted. Let me say it simply. At the basis of all opinions are beliefs. At the basis of all beliefs are judgments. At the basis of all judgments are fears. And at the basis of all fears is a layer of the ego defining who you are and trying its best to maintain its existence. A couple quick examples. True stories. My date turned to me at a party, pointing to a very nice-looking older woman on the dance floor who was dressed a little sexy and said, that woman's a tramp, which was her opinion. When I asked, why do you say that, my date responded, she should dance more appropriately for her age. That was her belief. Under that belief is a judgment, perhaps something like, it's wrong to be showing off your talents or your body. And under that judgment is a fear. Maybe I might lose my man to someone who looks and dances like that, and then I'd be alone for the rest of my life. And under that fear is a layer of the ego that whispers, I'm better than her, and I don't have to show off to prove it. If my date let go of her belief that the woman should dance more appropriately for her age, but kept the judgment that it's wrong to be showing off your talents or your body, she could simply form a new belief about the way women talk, or walk, 
or dress, or the length of their hair, to replace the old one about dancing. I had a very good friend who had opinions, beliefs, and judgments about women who wore the color pink. Didn't want to have anything to do with them. He's single, by the way. Based on some past experience he had, or maybe just his gut feeling. And he decided that his opinions, beliefs, and judgments were correct, and didn't want to think about letting go of them. And that's fine. But it wouldn't surprise me if his infinite eye sent him the perfect woman for him, dressed in pink, to give him another opportunity to think again. Another dear friend had the same kind of opinion, belief, and judgment about people who smoke. Fortunately, she let go of them when a man appeared in her hologram who smoked, and they've now been happily married for years. But this discussion is beyond the scope of these workshops. If you want to go further into this topic, I suggest you read my free ebook. Right now, I want to focus on the judgments we have that give rise to the beliefs we hold, so that we can let go of them. And if there's one thing I hope you will take away from these six hours of workshops, more important, perhaps. Than all the quantum physics stuff, and the brain research, and the models. It is that our judgments about our experiences, those arbitrary and arrogant, I might add, decisions about right and wrong, better and worse, good and bad, good and evil, are what cause all our pain and suffering. Because the problem is that as soon as we judge some experience to be bad or wrong or worse than we want it to be, we begin resisting that experience. And if there's one law that seems to be at work in both parts of the human game, it's what you resist persists. In other words. My infinite eye might be creating the same or similar experiences for me as long as I judge and resist them, which is an interesting new way to look at karma. And that includes war and violence, and all the other things many people are resisting and trying to get rid of in their lives, and on this planet. Take an objective look at what's going on out there. As far as I can tell, there are more peace workers than ever before, and there's also more war and violence than ever before. What you resist persists. As long as we resist war and violence, they will continue, and maybe even increase. But Mr. Fuller said. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. The way I would say it is, instead of judging and resisting what you see, and trying to change it, follow your excitement and live something radically new. Or as Mahatma Gandhi said. Be the change you wish to see in the world. But if it is your excitement and total joy to step in front of a tank, do it. But do it because it excites you in the moment and brings you joy, not because you are judging war and violence to be wrong and trying to stop it. If you remember, in part four of these workshops. I talked about the human game having two parts. Many people are judging and resisting being in the first part, trying their best to get out and into the second part. But what you resist persists. As long as we judge and resist the first part of the human game, we're likely to stay there until we don't anymore. Ironically, 
it seems that you can't leave the first part of the human game until you no longer want to, until you no longer resist being there, until you totally embrace and accept the first part for exactly the perfection it is. But, 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 I hear many people protesting, how can you call all the pain and suffering I see out there perfect? And now we're back full circle to the question of perception, how we perceive things, as Bashar would say it. In Part 4, I said we do not have the power or ability to change anything we see in our holograms, and we can stop wasting our time and energy trying. But we do have the power to change how we perceive our holograms, and then change our reactions or responses to them, by removing our judgment, belief, and opinion filters, as Dr. Lipton would say, allowing us to see the complete picture as it actually is.